The poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer by John Keats seems like a bit of a strange poem at first. It's all about reading a translation and then talking about how much you love it. Is that really that exciting? Well, what John Keats is trying to do here is he's not just giving you a kind of book review, he's also trying to create a certain emotion in you as a reader. He's trying to replicate that emotion. And that emotion is what we call the sublime. All right, so a lot of the romantic poets are trying to express the sublime, this, this feeling of wonder and awe. Uh, and at the end of this poem, he wants to create that in you. So the question is, will his description of reading Chapman's Homer, um, will his description make you feel as if you were there, as if you can feel the chills down your spine? Well, let's find out. So in terms of the context for this poem then, uh, Keats uh, actually read Homer with a friend. His friend's name was Charles Cowden Clark, and they spent all night reading this translation. Uh, they had the 1616 folio edition of Cha George Chapman's Homer, um, and they spent all night reading it, and they were really struck by particular passages that they enjoyed together. So in the morning, um, or late in the night, I guess, Keats went home. Uh, he got home at 6 a.m. to his house in Dean Street, and then he polished off this poem very quickly, very few revisions in this poem, and it was on his friend's desk by 10 a.m. So what he did when he got home is he actually just jotted down the rhyme scheme of a Petrarchan sonnet in the margin, and he wrote it, as I mentioned, very quickly. The biggest change in terms of later versions comes in line seven. So here we have, yet did I never breathe its pure serene. Uh, the original is quite different actually. He first wrote, yet could I never judge what men could mean, which doesn't sound quite as epic. So probably a good change that he made here. But we'll, we'll come back to line seven in a little bit. So he wrote this poem uh, quite quickly then. It was published in 1816 in The Examiner by the critic Lee Hunt as part of a, an essay called Young Poets. Uh, and Lee Hunt was very interested in uh, using these younger poets to give a sense of what was new in poetry, what was radical, what was exciting. Now you might think, well, what's so exciting about reading a translation? But part of what Keats is doing is he's not reading another translation. And the other translation that he's avoiding here is by Alexander Pope. So Alexander Pope, in the early 18th century, uh, about a century before Keats is writing, uh, gave us his translation of Homer, of the Odyssey and the Iliad, and it's much more neoclassical so it has heroic couplets, lots of rhyme. It has shorter lines as well in terms of the, the syllable count, uh, typically 10 syllables per line. And this kind of style makes it very elegant. Um, uh, it's a beautiful version, but what Keats was looking for was something more natural, more earthy, more um, focused on the, the content and um, the, the, the sheer heroism of the, uh, the original edition. So that makes this a little bit radical then in that Keats is not just reading a good translation. He's also going back to something that he found more authentic before the neoclassical movement that we tend to associate with the Enlightenment. Uh, and that's partially why this poem is often anthologized as representative of the Romantics in their rebellion against the previous period. Okay, so that gives us a little bit of context then. Um, let's start with the first quatrain, and here Keats writes, Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. So Apollo is the god of poetry, the bards are the poets, and the word fealty means loyalty to one's lord. The idea is then that Keats has read lots of poetry, <laughs> right? He has traveled through all these different realms, uh, many western islands, uh, and he is loyal, just like the other poets, to Apollo, who gives inspiration, 
who allows the poet to succeed. The description of traveling makes this quite heroic. So right away from the beginning, we have this epic sense that um, that what's what the poet is doing is not just reading, but is doing something really great. And as you go all the way through the poem, there are all these different figures that are being described. And you might almost call this a kind of catalog of heroes. So a catalog in an epic poem is a list, right? You can have a list of ships or trees or whatever. Um, and in this case, I think we have kind of this catalog of heroic deeds. So we have traveling, we have swimming, we have staring, we have looking, we have all these different verbs that express heroic actions. And Keats then is, is trying to create for us a sense of the epic as if we are not reading just a sonnet, but we are reading Homer. We are reading something that's similar to what Keats was experiencing. Okay, uh, now this word fealty introduces something that's not classical, and that's the feudal context. So the feudal context. Feudalism uh, describes a medieval service relationship. And within the feudal uh, historical period, you have a lord, a king, a magnate, you know, some kind of high up figure, who then also has vassals, who has people below him. And these are not just peasants, right? Vassals can be, uh, they can be uh, barons or who knows what, who are serving higher up lords. So this is a service contract. It's not spoiled by money or anything like that. And that would be the, the capitalist movement that came after feudalism, as Marx would say. Uh, and the, the term fealty then means loyalty to one's lord. Another term that relates to this is the word demean, a little bit further. So demean, this refers to the lands that go with the manor, that are associated specifically with the castle or the manor of the knight. It can also be interpreted a bit more generally to just mean realm or kingdom. So it says, deep-browed Homer ruled as his kingdom or as his manorial lands. It's somewhat strange maybe to look to the Middle Ages suddenly when you're talking about um, an epic classical work. But part of this is actually to look for epic experiences in many different places as part of our catalog of heroes. Uh, and so we can draw on the medieval context as well to give us a sense of the epic nature of this. So he writes then, oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. He's saying he'd often heard of Homer uh, ruling in his own territory, which would be the Greek language, but he hadn't really come close enough uh, to experience what this country is like. And so reading again is described as traveling through different countries, which is quite a fantastical uh, description really. The seventh line, as mentioned, uh, was revised later, yet did I never breathe its pure serene. And a lot of critics point out that this is actually an echo of Alexander Pope. When Pope translated the Iliad, he writes in book eight, uh, he has this line where he writes, when not a breath disturbs the pure serene. Very close, isn't it, to our version, yet did I never breathe its pure serene. So the question is, what is Keats doing with that? And there are different ways to interpret that. Um, you could say that, that maybe he's mocking the original by invoking it, but that would definitely undercut the epic tone of this sonnet then, right? So maybe that wouldn't work. Um, another possibility is that he's creating a contrast because in, in uh, Pope's version, there is no breath when not a breath disturbs the pure serene, whereas here there is a breathing in, so perhaps that's a contrast. Another possible contrast is actually between line seven and eight. Uh, lines, line seven is fairly Latinate, it's fairly abstract. Uh, line eight is very natural and the words are very simple, right? We have lots of monosyllables, till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold, it's, it's almost all monosyllables. I guess we can add the other words too, till, I, out, and, and. Um, but what we have here is these simple actions. And notice how the verb heard 
actually contrasts with earlier verbs. This is something that the critic Helen Wendler has pointed out. Uh, you have, have I traveled? Have I been? Right? Had I been told? And then suddenly, till I heard. So much sim simpler. And there's this kind of naturalness to this, as if now we're speaking in traditional Anglo-Saxon English, uh, and it's to the point, and that's definitely the effect that is being created here. The last six lines, what we call the sestet, uh, after the octave, the last six lines um, introduce us then to this experience. And we get this, again, through a number of different figures who are being described. We have an astronomer, the watcher of the skies. We have Cortez, and then we also have all his men. And they all are all doing a kind of looking. So this is definitely about vision. Vision is critical to understanding and appreciating the sublime. The first of these figures is the watcher of the skies. And it seems that uh, John Keats is likely referring to the discovery of Uranus, the planet Uranus, which was spotted in 1781 by William Herschel, the astronomer. And so uh, it seems that Keats read about this in a book called Introduction to Astronomy by the writer Bonnie Castle. Uh, and in other words, he's not just describing the reading of Chapman's Homer, but he's describing these other reading experiences as well. It's a surprisingly complicated poem. So some reading experiences then start to color other reading experiences, which is really interesting. Similarly, the last few lines are indebted to Robertson's History of America, where he talks about Cortez uh, seeing the Pacific. Now we'll get to Cortez in a minute here because it's actually the wrong figure. Uh, but uh, clearly these lines are inspired by various things that Keats had read as well. If we look at the astronomer here, notice the, the verb swims. It's like the planet is personified and the planet is doing something heroic, swimming into his vision, his knowledge, his perspective. Uh, and you might say, well, the watcher of the skies is somewhat passive then, and that, that is true. And maybe that's why we look for other images, like Cortez staring, for instance. Um, but at the same time, there is still this this heroic activity. And there's also a sense in which we zoom way out. The sublime is all, always about perspective, right? And so we look at all the planets, all the stars, and we have this massive perspective that makes this truly epic and sublime. Okay, as mentioned, Cortez is the wrong figure. It should be Balboa, historically. So it was Balboa who saw the Pacific first, if we're talking about white guys. Um, and Cortez came along later. It turns out that Keats did make a mistake. He was writing from memory, and his friend uh, Char um, Charles Cowden Clark pointed that, this out right away. But Keats left the reference to Cortez in here, partially because of the rhythm. Balboa is three syllables. Um, and some people have also pointed out that maybe it's a fortunate mistake, if not a deliberate mistake, because Cortez sees secondhand. And if you think of what Keats is doing, he's also seeing secondhand. So Chapman is a little bit like Balboa, who sees Homer first, or sees the Pacific first, and then Keats is more like Cortez, in a sense, who reads Chapman, who reads Homer, right? There's this, this focus on second-hand experiences. And we even have third-hand experiences, because we have all his men who are not looking at the Pacific, they are looking at each other, after they have looked at Cortez looking at the Pacific. So it's very complicated, isn't it? Um, what we see here then is a real focus on looking and of being a latecomer. Keats feels like he's late to the classics, but even so he can make it his own. He can write this poem to make it his own. One of the things that he does in this final section to make it really epic is he works with the different stresses and rhythms. And we saw this actually earlier in the poem already. So if we, if we look back a little bit, and we look at deep-browed Homer here, right in the middle, right? Deep-browed Homer. 
Think about the stresses there. It's deep-browed Homer. Only the last syllable is unstressed. And when you have this deep-browed Homer, it does create that epic feeling, doesn't it? Uh, this real focus on how important this is. You have something similar with stout Cortez. Stout Cortez in these lines. And in both cases, what also connects them is that you have a description that we call an epithet. An epithet. So an epithet is a little tag that goes with a name. If you think of Zeus the Cloud Gatherer or Wily Odysseus, this is very common in classical epic that you have an epithet that goes with the hero and that makes this really part of our catalog of heroes as we said before. So we have these moments of extra stresses and as we get to the end he really pulls out all the stop by playing stops by playing with pauses and stresses. So if you look at the last four lines we read or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes eagle eyes that's a very epic awe inspiring description right as as high up as you can be he stared at the Pacific and then we have this dash this pause and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise and notice that here we have actually what we call enjambment enjambment which is where the the line keeps going there is no pause so that's the opposite of what we would expect all his men looked right it keeps going um, and then we have these dramatic moments with a wild surmise silent upon a peak in Darien do you hear that right you have you have surmise surmise silent upon a peak in Darien and so by having these two stresses in a row, surmise, silent, it really forces you to pause, draws your attention, and then it's as if the poem trails off a little bit at the end, upon a peak in Darien. And notice that we don't end with a stress so much. It's more like Darien. And usually the iambic pentameter line ends with a stress, so we would expect much a much stronger rhyme with men, men, right, Darien. Uh, Darien, by the way, is, is part of Panama. So the, the poem kind of trails off, tails off a little bit at the end. And that creates this wonderful contrast between, on the one hand, you have these stresses, the, this emphasis, this vision, right? The eagle eyes, the peak. Uh, it's the highest point. And then on the other hand, you have this amazing pause, this silence, this awe where nothing can be said the calmness, the lack of stress. Um, and so these lines really work very well. At least that's what Keats was trying to do. And what he wants to do is to create in you the feeling of the sublime. Are you seeing it? Are you there? So are you like all the men who are following Cortez? Are you following Keats? Right? I think that's one of the final questions in this poem. So do you find it sublime? Well, I will leave that up to you, but I hope that you've enjoyed this explanation of a very famous romantic sonnet.